things that you don't hear too often. Is be, and the reason why is because everybody lives in 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 homes that have electricity and running water and so forth. So people just stay inside. You know, they don't go outside anymore. And but you know, but back in in the days when my mom was a little kid. And you're always outside, and the only time you you came inside was to eat and to go to sleep, yeah. Because a lot of these houses they just had two rooms, and usually the mom and dad sleep in one room, and everybody out sleeps in the other room, which is you know it's bedroom for everybody. Plus it's a living room, and and there's a stove and ice box in the corner. Yeah, there were no refrigerators. So you use the ice box, or, or or you put it in the ground, or something like that. And and the stove was usually these really old stoves that you you know you throw you throw you know little boards or little pieces of wood in there from time to time, and it's like a cast iron top, and you use the cast iron frying pan. You know those those kind of stoves are really considered fashionable today in Europe, yeah. You go to these uh, really high fashion furniture stores, and they have this <laughs> all this furniture that my grandparents had. That's really high fashion. <laughs> it's just it's just ushika, yeah. <laughs> it's just pitiful. <laughs> and here you go into this uh, this store. There's a store here. I forgot what it's called. I went I went there a couple months ago, and and. Uh, <laughs> I was like, gee, we had a stove, or we had a table like that when, you know, when I was a little boy, and and I I would never buy a table like that because you know that reminds me of really poor times, yeah. And then that table selling for eight hundred euro, because <laughs> they they don't make them anymore, yeah. And so and it's Americana, yeah. So Germans are really into Americana. Not all of, them, but a lot of them are. So when they want, they they just have this fascination to take their summer holidays and go to America, and they want to travel on Route 66 as if this is a parrot American paradise or something like that. It's really it, a lot of Germans are really into that. Yeah. So the so these old tables that were the norm back in the 1950s and 60s, they all want to get those too. Yeah. So because uh, it's Stylish, it's Americana, and and that stuff is like eight hundred euro. I can, I, you can go to dump any dump pile in America and find one of these tables. <laughs> here, here in Germany, they're almost a thousand U.S. dollars. Yeah, <laughs> I find that just silly. Anyway, um, uh, yeah. So, um, w- with my mother and. Um, uh, like I said, you know, during the daytime they're always outside because there's things that that need to be done. Yeah, there was a garden that needed to be tended to. They had to go get water. They had to chop wood. Um, you know, they had to uh, prepare things. And a lot of times they cooked outside because yeah, it was so hot. They cooked outside in the shade, and when it was lunchtime, people, you know, the the people who are working in the fields, my my uh dad my my grandfather he had a ranch so so he was uh you know his sons they um what do you call it they they ran cattle and and, and horses and stuff like that so lunchtime they'd come in and and eat yeah right outside and it was like a little community yeah it was uh, uh my mom's uh oldest brother uh who was actually my mother was the oldest one, yeah. But the, so the oldest brother was a little bit younger than her. Him and his family they lived right next to us. So there's like two houses, and then so there's a barn, there's a chicken coop, and it was all like in a circle, yeah. And so it was kind of cool, you know. And you think about that, I always wonder what that would look like today. I see it in my mind, but this is, but what I see is from a little boy's point of view. Yeah, and you know when you're a little kid, everything seems bigger. So um, I wonder what that would look like today if I could see all that. Yeah, the house is probably much smaller than I thought it was. Anywho, um, so 
they were outside most of the time, yeah. Or you know, they go fishing, or they go you know picking picking uh, chook cherries or plums, or they're making you know chook cherry uh, uh, patties, drying them for wojapi they're going to use later, or maybe they're making jams, or you know they're they're always doing something. Yeah, every day they're doing something, and but they're outside, they're out in nature, and so they're out there until the evening time. You know, they're having fun out there until it's literally time to go to sleep. You know, they'll go inside, you know, because it's too dark. But then they, they um, then they go to sleep. Yeah, everybody just gets their their bed roll out and and you know they lay on the floor, lay wherever there's room and. And just crash out, and it was kind of like camping out every night in a way. Do you know what I mean? And and um, I mean, for me, I mean, I remember that as a little boy. Um, so you know, we're always outside, always outside. So there were things that you saw outside too, that I think today, if you saw those things, it probably scared the shit out of you. If you don't know what that is, even from my generation, they've seen these things. And one of them is what they call the fireball, which is a really interesting uh, thing, yeah? Where uh, it's just it's this ball of fire that's just uh, bouncing around out in the middle of nowhere. Um, when it uh, when it moves, it's it's it, it like I said, it is a ball of fire. But whatever it touches doesn't catch fire. You know what I mean? And it's not, this is not an Indian thing, okay? This is just out there in nature. Because um, even uh, farmers, you know, white farmers, uh, when they first came as, as immigrants on the, onto, you know, uh, around the reservations, they have the same stories too because they were always outside as well. So they have the same um, experiences with these fireballs, where they're just, um, you know, like say for example, you, you you hardly ever see them in the daytime. Usually when it's nighttime they come up. So you know they'll be like maybe they're maybe they're visiting relatives, you know, that live in another log cabin, and so they're uh, coming back now, yeah, and uh, so they're coming back team and wagon or riding horses or whatever and suddenly the see horses are very you know extra sensory kind of animals so they pick up on things way quicker than most humans do and so <laughs> the horses will their ears will go all kinds of directions and they 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 don't know what they, they don't know to act they don't know how to act and then that you know people observe that and they so they stop the horse yeah and because they have to keep the horse stopped because it might bolt, yeah, and just totally take off. So, um, so then they 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 try to keep the horses calm, and then they look around to see if it's a fireball. That's the first thing they think is it must be a fireball. Because when, if it's a wolf or a coyote, the horse reacts a different way. Yeah, you know how you know what things are by how your horse reacts. So you really have to know your horses. Yeah, you really you, you said because you know they're going to tell you things by the way they react, by the way their ears move, by the way they you know make their sounds and by the way they walk. You know what 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 it what it is. And um like I said a lot of times uh people saw them um when you know traveling in the late evening time and uh and you know it's you just see them you don't just rolling around out there um you see them um you know just uh just bouncing around yeah like the, like a uh, um and one one family story they were riding back home and um they saw that and so um this one came kind of quick though, yeah. So they they were moving along, and here, this fireball just pulled up beside them, 
and it was probably about a meter high, yeah, and um, or three feet high, and it's just just bouncing, yeah, just like just like like a bouncing ball, and it went it just traveled with the wagon for a while, <laughs> and so when they stopped the wagon, um, it it. It, it moved further, yeah, and it seemed to pick up speed after the wagon stop. It seemed to pick up speed, so it's telling me it's electromagnetic, yeah. Um, <laughs> but when people don't understand these kind of things, so they make all kinds of stories up. Yeah, another another one. Um, my childhood best friend, his family has a really interesting story too, where in. Um, their his grandparents um they're living out in the country in their log cabin and they heard something it's like a weird noise on the door that wasn't um uh, knocking or anything like that. It's just a weird noise. So the uh the wife was gonna peek out and see what it was. Maybe it's uh cat or something trying to get in or whatever so she peeked out and there was a fireball out there so she really backed away and here it came in it bounced through the through the uh, the log cabin and what was peculiar is it just went through the wall and so they're they're wondering well why did it stop at the door if it can go through the wall why didn't it come through the door that was the interesting dilemma yeah the, the what what what's the deal behind that yeah why why did it uh why did it stop at the door but you know when it came in it just went through the wall <laughs> they're really confused yeah? they're like i don't understand that one maybe 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 the door uh there's metal on it or something or i don't know maybe it maybe there was something about it that kind of stopped it they don't really know but they they never ever felt that it was a ghost because you you didn't get that feeling, yeah. It, you, your your uh, hair on your back never rose and you know things like that. Plus, remember uh, what I said on this sto- uh, show many many times that in Lakota Star knowledge there are no ghosts. Yeah, that uh, what people think are ghosts are are something different, and uh, it's a lot of times these are a residue. Uh, from an experience that plays over and over because it was really traumatic because you know what what we do is the communication and when it's really really uh, highly emotional or emotional volatile there's an energy that stays in that area from that experience whatever it is whether it's a massacre a murder a rape you know uh, something really horrible uh, gets left behind there by the people, you know, who are there. So it's it's not only just a, a perpetrator, but also the victim. They leave an energy there, and sometimes you can feel that. Yeah, and it's and some and then people misunderstand it. They say, "Oh, they're trapped here. They can't move on," and that's what it is. No, 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 no. They've moved on already. What this is is the residue, and all that has to be done is it has to be neutralized. That's all. Then it stops. Yeah, that's no big deal. But see, people who don't understand and they have really active imaginations, they'll say, oh, these two souls, they're trapped and they can't move on and, and this girl's too scared, so that's why she doesn't... No, no, that's not that's not the case at all. Yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is residue. Because emotions stay with the physical body. Yeah, they do not go with the soul. Soul has no shape. The soul has no mind or personality because that belongs to the brain. And to prove to you, you know, there are people who who are you know are into they get into really bad accidents in which they really bang up their head. And they go into coma, and a lot of times when they come out of it, they're a different person. Their brain rewired itself. So they have a different personality, and they have no recollection of the old self at all. Yeah, this, this shows you that the the personality is created by the brain. That's not the soul. That's the brain. Okay. 
So when a person dies, the personality stays along with the emotions. This is in Lakota Star Knowledge Way. So if that's the case, what you know, a ghost, if there is such a thing, cannot have emotions, it cannot have a personality, it cannot have a voice because sound is created through our voice boxes. Yeah. But in these residue experiences, you know, these things that people see, sometimes they smell it, sometimes they hear it. And that's all from that residue. That's not a soul, okay? That's residue. People really need to understand that, that there's a big difference between that. Anyway, um, so when 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 you experience something like that, you know, your hair your, on your arm stands up and, you know, you... <laughs> but with the fireball, it doesn't do that for some reason. So uh, unless you really freaked out, <laughs> then you probably will. But most people, they see it, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa Jesus. And then they're like, dang, what is that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> it, 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 it's just a strange thing. You know? It's really a strange thing. And the and a lot of scientists explain it by saying it's it's because of chemicals. There's usually there might be some location where there's certain kind of chemicals coming up from the ground. Like there's probably an opening someplace. Maybe maybe a, a gopher uh, or a um, badger um, dug up a, a tunnel or something, and they realized they tapped into a natural gas line or something and they're like oh geez and so then they they take off and go dig a hole someplace else now you have this this hole where this stuff is coming up from under the ground and sometimes this it, this will make it to the surface and when it touches a certain temperature then it it, 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 it what do you call it, it flames yeah it, it lights up and, and it's just bouncing around and that's basically what it is so it's it's not a psychic phenomena, okay? <laughs> but but see, back then people they don't know, yeah. They don't know these things, and uh, and so um, this is um, people really build up stories, yeah. And, and sometimes it goes too far. But um, when you hear the the uh, farmers, the white farmers, they're their their stories that that never seems like a ghost story. Yeah? It's always like, no, this is just a, a weird thing that happens out there. Yeah, it's a weird uh, element of nature, um, and uh, it's it's they don't understand it. But the thing, what what they do know is it doesn't seem to harm anybody. Yeah, it doesn't harm anybody, and and when you when you go at the um, explanation that it's a chemical thing that's coming from under the ground then it makes sense that when it touches the grass the grass doesn't start on fire yeah it makes sense uh, this is not a supernatural being yeah this is this this is coming from the ground now <clears throat> however there are in Lakota star knowledge stories about beings who live in fire. Now that is really interesting. Yeah, this is a whole different turkey here. Yeah, this is a turkey with different kind of feathers here in this situation. I was saying some things about these fireballs and how back in 50 years, 50, 60, 70 years ago, people would see these things out in the country kind of. Um, uh, frequently, yeah, it, it wasn't uh, anything to be scared of. Um, it's just that they didn't understand what it was, but there wasn't anything that was scary concerning them. It just it kind of took you by surprise, and and people would just watch it. Yeah, they would say, "Look at that!" Like they might see one coming down a hill, for example, and then people would say, "Look at that!" And you know, some people might go, "Yeah." take off but then you know uh after they get the nerve to look at it they realize that it's it's oh huh, this is not really uh it's not a monster yeah so um it 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 
was not something supernatural. Yeah, this is something a lot of people, you know, right away they anything they don't understand, right away they put some kind of supernatural uh, thing to it, and people really have active imaginations, and they say, "Oh, that's a, a demon, or that's a, a soul of um, somebody," and then this is, you know, he's just roaming the earth forever, you know, all kinds of jibber jabber like that. And uh, this is not the case. It's this, this, this is uh, from nature. Yeah, this is uh, coming from natural gases, and these kind of things just happen. It's not, not anything, um, you know, uh, not anything to be overly concerned about. They're not warning you of the future or anything like that. It's just that happens. Yeah, this, this, there's places in the ground that. Certain gases just seep up, yeah, from the, and and when they hit a certain temperature, uh, they illuminate, and this is what that is. It's no big deal. But um, in Lakota Star knowledge, we have these um, beings that um, live in the fire. See, there was a time period in our creation story where the Wakantanka. Now, Wakantanka is not God, okay? A lot of people, 99% of the Lakota people are going to define Wakantanka as uh, the Christian God, but it's not. Now, this is not God. This is an organization, and even then, there's more than one organization. The, and it's not about, you know, which one is good and which one is bad. It's not like that at all. What it's about is... Um, is that they just work differently. Yeah? Neither one is better than the other. Neither one is the evil one. You know, it's not, not like that at all. They just work differently. And they're all organizations. This is Wakantanka. Okay? So, in the beginning of the creation, there was only one at that time. Yeah? One Wakantanka group. And they went through a time period where um, at, at at a certain time, there were eight members in this group. Um, previous to that time, there were only four. Okay, today in that first group, there are sixteen. Okay, so at the point in the story, there's eight. All right. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. These eight members of this Wakantanka, they created beings. From themselves, yeah, they created beings that uh, this is we're talking at the beginning of the earth, basically. Yeah, how old is the earth? 4.54 billion years. Gee, according to the Bible, it's 6,000 years old. <laughs> now that's silly. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I always like to. Uh, whenever I meet the Christian, I always like to say, "Well, how, how does the Bible explain dinosaurs? Oh, the, the, they, they don't exist. Those are actually bones from uh, something else." Yeah, <laughs> that's one response. Another response is like, "Oh, that was part of a process." And, and I say, "Okay, I can agree with that." But yet, yeah, the Bible says that God made the earth in six days. So. Explain that. Yeah, I, I I'm here to learn. Yeah, fill me with biblical knowledge. <laughs> it's never been done yet. So, <laughs> four point five billion years ago. That's pretty gosh darn old. That's a long time. Yeah, uh, that's 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 even Monia. That's older than you and me combined together. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> oh, man. So, billions of years ago, this happened, where these eight members of this Wakantanka created beings. And some of the beings live in fire. Some of the beings live in water. Some of the beings live in the ozone layer. Some of them are winds. Some of them are thunders. Some of them are 
Oh, I better keep quiet on this one because we're talking about the moon here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to say what that one is. That's kind of secret here. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, we want to focus on the ones that live in the fire. These are beings that, um, like I said, they're created by these eight, eight individuals. This would be considered sacred. Yeah, these are sacred individuals, and they have a purpose. Okay, they have a purpose. There's things about fire that we don't really understand as a whole that humans really don't understand. But number one is we should respect it. Yeah, that this is something that really needs to be. Uh, we should be grateful for it and. We need to respect it because it is uh, it is part of life. So this needs to be adhered to. Yeah, we we really we really need to be keep you know to keep these things in mind. A lot of people you know they they think um, you know people always always have this fantasy that yeah let's talk to them yeah let's um, let's um, you know. Let's work with them. Yeah, let's, you know, all these kind of things. But it's not, you have to realize that these are different kind of beings, okay? A lot of people think that, you know, okay, if we we have voices and we can talk, that, uh, so we, we um, apply that same attribute to um, everything else, yeah? So um, we talk to our our um, plants and expect them to talk to us back. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, see what what the, the thing is. Everything communicates, but it does it in its own way. And uh, so yes, you know we can talk to our plants. We can talk to our you know, but uh, we shouldn't be. It's not like, hey, Mr. Tree, how's it, how's it going? Yeah, I and mean, yeah, you can say that. But what the tr- what the plants are picking up are as not your words. Now they don't speak English. They don't speak German. They don't speak Japanese. Okay, but what they're picking up on is um, your energy. Yeah, the way you exhibit your communication yeah the way you do that that's that's uh, what they pick up on so from that vibe they react accordingly you know so if if you <laughs> if you say to your plant you know you're let's say you come home and you're all pissed off and you say God damn son of a bitch. Jesus Christ, I have to water these fucking green things all the time. Hey, hi, plant. How are you doing? Mm, put a bunch of water on there and walk away. Yeah, And you think that just because you said, hi, plant, how are you doing, that your plant's going to grow really good. <laughs> it doesn't understand English. But what it does pick up on is the way you communicate it. So, you know, you were doing this grudgingly, like you did not respond, did not want that responsibility. So this is what it picks up on. And then it decides it's not going to grow. It doesn't feel the love. Yeah. So it, or either that, it grows very weak and um, it, it doesn't blossom like it should. And it, it, it might even be smaller than it's supposed to be. So this is uh, this is what I mean when I'm talking about communication with different species. This is how it is with these things too. Yeah, you just don't say, okay, we're gonna go into a sweat lodge and call these beings in and and we're gonna talk to them and you know and uh, and it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, that's not the way it goes. I mean, there are some holy people who can communicate with them. But they don't do it in Lakota. Yeah? There's a different method, and it's a sacred thing. So it's not, you know, some people think, well, as long as you you mean it from your heart, they'll understand. Not necessarily. They'll know your intention is good, but 
they don't necessarily understand what you're saying. You see what I mean? So there's more to it than that. And um, the most important thing is that uh, what you're putting out there, yeah, what what are you putting out there? That's how you communicate. Yeah, how you say things, how you do things, and it's not just you know that's outgoing. It's not just that; it's incoming too. Yeah, it's how you understand something. It's how you comprehend something. It's how you form your thoughts and 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 you know all that kind of thing. That that's all communication to how do you listen. How good do you listen? Yeah, all of this is communication. So how you do that? That creates a certain frequency in you. This is your song, okay? This is what the plants pick up on. This is what other beings pick up on. Is your song, and that song is made by how you live. So it doesn't matter. You know, it's it, it's it's not. You know, required for you to say, okay, there's beings that live in the fire, so we gotta contact them and and show and, and show them that we are good people, that we mean them no harm, and that you know we can help if they help us defeat ISIS. Then, yeah. <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? <laughs> this is not the purpose. This is absolutely not. Then you're using it for selfish, yeah, selfish reason then your energy is going to exhibit that. And so this is what they pick up on. They're going to see that as unhealthy. They don't understand what you're saying, but they're going to feel that it's unhealthy and they're not going to want a part of that. You see what I mean? So it's not about establishing contact. It's about how you live your life. How you live, how you live your life shows these beings that it's okay. Yeah, that that it's uh, that they can do their work. That uh, you're not going to be a um, obstacle to their work. That's how you work with them by not being an obstacle. That's the basic, the ba- most basic way. And they may actually, you know, they may actually accomplish a lot of things because you're living in a healthy way. So you really are making a contribution to their work by living in a healthy way. You see what I mean? It's just like with the plants, yeah? Like when you're a nice person, you're you're not a codependent and you're you're not an abuser, you're um you you do your best living in a healthy way. You know when you have to say no and and um you know the power of losing. Uh, you know the the value of weaknesses, and you know all these kind of things. And you understand all of that. You know your plants pick up on that, and they grow. They really, really grow, and they put out the prettiest flowers. They put out the, the you know, best tasting tomatoes and all these kind of things and it's all because of how you are as a person yeah i always tell this story about my former best friend was a very very uptight woman very hectic very uh frantic as the best word i can describe and i tell you something uh, since we've not been friends, uh, boy, my life has become relaxed. Yeah, <laughs> I I can't believe how much relaxed I am. <laughs> so that's a kind of a side blessing there. Yeah, that I don't have to put up with her frantic personality, and I don't miss it either. Yeah, I'm finding that that really kind of stressed me. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't have that anymore, which is fine with me. I'm not. I'm okay with that now. This lady doesn't do drugs. She doesn't. Uh, you know, she's not a. a be- she does. She don't beat anybody up or anything like that. And uh, she sees herself as a generally nice person. She can be nice when she wants to be, but when she gets angry, she goes overboard at the same time. But she's really, really frantic. She has. I think she has a problem with rage. And I've tried to point that out to her as a friend, 
in the past, but uh, people who have rage, they uh, think that you're the one who has the problem. Uh, they don't really take you seriously. Yeah, so it's until something hits rock bottom for them, then they then they see it. That's in like an addiction. Yeah, that's really a problem. Anyway, um, this every spring, this lady, you know, goes to the um, plant places and and buys flowers, you know, little pots of flowers and and stuff like that, and she puts them on the balcony. Um, that's what a lot of people do here in the city. And, you know, they put um, flowers on their balcony and make it look real nice and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and she, you know, she she takes care of them. You know, she follows the instructions that the people in the flower shops give her, you know, because she asks them how much water does this need. And they all tell her, you know, they tell her what to do and how much, you know, how often that they need to be watered and stuff like that. So she follows all of that. But still, about six weeks later, these plants start dying. Yeah, they pick up on her energy, and they they can't grow. Yeah, they they slow, and then pretty soon they, you know, what's green now becomes yellow, and <laughs> the, the flowers, the petals are it's not even fall yet, but they're all. <laughs> Laying on the on the on the floor of the balcony, yeah, and <laughs> it's like this is this is this just just so obvious that you know that you know even with good intentions, it's still her energy is too frantic, yeah, it's too frantic, and 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 the plants pick up on us and they won't grow. But she has another friend who who runs a flower shop. And if you go to her apartment, oh, everything is just blossoming everywhere. Yeah, her her plants are just magnificent, and uh, and, and it's it's like she's like you know the the plant whisperer or something, you know, because they all love it when she enters the room, and they all, yes, we'll grow for you, you know, <laughs> kind of thing like that. And my farmer. Uh, best friend is totally the opposite. Yeah, the plants just will not, will not grow. So um, <laughs> I really find that comical now when I think about that. So you see, it doesn't matter how, what you say because they don't understand English. They don't understand German. But what they do pick up on is your energy. So when you use that knowledge yeah, that I just gave here, this the it's the same principle when you're when you're dealing with you know other beings that like for example live in the fire it's the same principle they don't understand your language but they pick up on your energy so they know you know they they know you know uh, how to uh, carry themselves around you do you see what i mean so um even if you try to establish a contact with them they still feel your energy and what could result could be very very dangerous because you're bringing it about you're bringing it about yourself and that could really 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 produce a catastrophe yeah that's like uh, when when people say you better be careful you're playing with fire and that's kind of what they're talking about yeah that uh, you don't know what you're doing when you're playing with fire because fire has its own mind yeah it's just something that needs to be respected as I said before but these creatures like I said they live in the fire and um, they do serve a purpose they are they do they do have a work yeah uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, this is a true story. It happened not too long ago. By the way, this belief that I said here just now, a lot of Indians have this belief from different tribes. They have a, a concerning the fire. Yeah, and there's one. See, uh, every year um, in America, there's a, a fire season. Yeah, this is where a lot of forest fires start because of lightning strikes or maybe it, uh, it's too dry there's drought and 
and you know something happens and what whatever then the next thing you know there's a huge forest fire happening so uh, the different um, there's places in America where they where you um you can be you know you can you know fight fire and these kind of things and you get you get high a, a really big paycheck it's a seasonal job yeah and you make a lot of money because it's really 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 dangerous and a lot of indians go into this because um indians because of our genetics we can stand the heat li- literal heat uh, more than white people can in general okay so and of course black people can they can stand even more yeah because it has to do with our genetic makeup um and so the indians in the southwest they are really dark because they're closer to the sun than we are those guys can really bear the heat without a problem yeah it's it's really nothing to them and we're like this too to a degree because south dakota also gets blazingly hot during the summer so it's it's something we can stand but the southwest indians they have that more so they can stand it a little bit more yeah so a lot of these fire fighting companies they're made up of these indians from you know the southwest apaches and you know people like that and this happened in the 1980s i think either the late 1980s or the early 1990s there was a, a White Mountain Apache firefighting crew that was battling a fire in Colorado. And, um, you know, they were, uh, their fire chief was, uh, uh, they're all Apache, yeah, all White Mountain Apache. And they they were, you know, digging, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, it was a fire line or something like that. And there's two guys where <laughs> their, their fire was just right there, yeah. And so these two guys are like, they were looking at the fire because they thought they saw something moving. And they thought, shit, is somebody burning in the fire? Because they thought maybe there's somebody on fire and that they need to run in and rescue them, yeah? So they're really watching to make sure. And here they saw some, they saw two things in the fire moving, yeah? And and it looked like it made a face, yeah, the the fire. It looked like it, it made two faces and and. When they looked at these faces, these faces were were um discomforted. Yeah, they they were they were um troubled. And so they told their um fire captain right away, yeah, they said, Hey, there's we saw two guys in the fire. Uh so what what they look like? They said they they look troubled. And they said, Where are they standing at? So he took the fire chief over there and um he didn't see them because by that time they're gone. Yeah, but he dis- these two guys described them exactly what they saw. And I said they're wearing a certain kind of clothes. So he, they dis- he, they went in secret. Now just these three, uh, they were older, so they were talking and they said, this, yeah, they they had certain um, symbols on, on their clothes and their clothes are really different than human clothes. They said it's really strange. And I said, okay. You know, you know what that is. That's what it is. He said. So they said, oh, okay. So they um, they loaded up the crew. And they said, okay, we're going. We're leaving. Yeah. And so there, the other firefighters like, huh? We're just not starting. No, we're leaving. He said. So they got in their their um, their vehicles, and the, and of course the big major uh, fire chief came over, and he's like, what do you think you guys are doing? They said, sorry. We're leaving," he said. "We're we're not going to fight this one. He said, we're going to let this one go." And the other that this this fire chief uh, this that was overseeing them, their boss. I mean, he was a white guy. I said, "Well, we're not going to pay you for that one. Well, that's fine with us. We're not going to go in there. So you can bring your own team and you see what happens." Yeah. So that's what they did. So these Apache guys headed back to Apache land, and these two guys had to go into a cleansing ceremony down there because they saw something sacred so <laughs> this white crew went in and they ended up losing several firefighters to the fire and they lost to the fire they had eventually they had to retreat because it was too intense so um 
This is a true story. Yeah? This was in several Indian publications during that time. That's where I read it. This is not uh, secret knowledge. This is this is in public, the public press. Yeah, and if you search for it, you can probably find it on the internet. I bet you anything, it's on the internet. And uh, so they see. See, this is White Mountain Apache. So you see, they have a similar belief of these beings that live in the fire. See, these were traditional guys, and they knew that if they, if they had a trouble look on their expression. That means that they shouldn't be there, that they're supposed to do this work, yeah, that they're supposed to cleanse the area, and so um they backed off yeah they they went back home right away, and they told the holy people there, and they had to get cleansed because of that very interesting story, so all you have to do is let them do their work, they do not need your help, okay. <laughs> There's a guy out there that teaches courses on these kind of things, and <laughs> this is my message to him. Yeah, so they don't need your help because you can't comprehend their fullness. The fire has a work to do uh, when it's naturally, when it's natural, okay? Because sometimes there's fire that's not natural; it's man-made. When I say man-made, that's like the fire that's used to melt metal. The best way to say this is with intention. What is the intention um, of um, the creation of the fire? You know, like say for example, you you're going out camping and you want to roast some marshmallows and hot dogs, and so you make a campfire. And see, see, your intention is to eat. Yeah, your intention is to have a good time. You're all you're mindful though, yeah. You you make sure the fire is out, and you know you don't just leave a fire burning and walk away. You 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 respect it, and you know you when you put it out, you 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 do it to make sure it's out before you leave. Yeah. This is kind of what I mean, but when you're using it for other things, like saying making weapons to kill people, then that's another that's another intention. When you when you have a fire, and you're doing it with a good intention, um, then it has you know, a different kind of outcome. But sometimes in nature, things um, have to be renewed. You know, they go through a renewal, and uh, and so it's like parts of the earth have to be burnt. And it's not destroying anything, really. Yeah, it's it's uh, rejuvenating the ground um, so that things will always grow. Because if it's not done, then something could happen to the land. That uh, you know, this is part of our responsibility of being t- caretakers of the land. That we need to um, do these kind of things and. And that's what used to happen, yeah, long, long, long time ago, thousands of years ago. That's what used to happen. In North America, the tribes in the center of the continent had this understanding that every ten years they're going to burn their area. So they organized, yeah, this is a year of peace, so no battles are supposed to happen. You put down your weapons because whatever runs on that, that's feeding everybody. Buffalo, deer, you see what I mean? That's that's all going to feed us. So we need to make sure they have food. So this this time, this year, this every tenth year, is a, you know, there has to be peace throughout the whole center part of North American continent. And then the Indians then proceed to burn their territory. So that this adds nutrients to the ground. It adds nitrogen to the ground. So that the ground will always be putting up, you know, wild vegetables, wild wheat. Yeah. So this is what the uh, animals eat, and then then we take. I mean, what, when we take, we always vow to give something back. And part of that is we do a ceremony and give something back, and also. 
this burning the Great Plains every 10 years is also part of that too. Yeah, we're always reciprocating. We, we never just take. There's always another giving that we do. And what we take, we never take just for ourselves. We take it for everybody who's hungry. Yeah, and uh, this is the understanding back then. This is the community way of thinking back in those years, in those times. So this is how we're working with the fire. So we're doing this, and these beings in the fire are now doing their work. They are replenishing, they're putting things into the ground, into the earth, so that things can grow. That's part of their work. Now, when we came into European contact, and then because there were too many of them, and they were just militarily too many with more weapons, we were defeated and placed on reservations. And uh, so since that time, we have not been doing our responsibility. And so, there has to be a balance. So the fact that the, um, you know America started to develop and, and people are starting to, you know, say, okay, you know, we're, this is my land and, and I'm going to plant beets or whatever, you know, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, then and then if the land is too dry, then we're irrig- making irrigation, um, you know, pipelines, water pi- water lines to to the farms that have no water, which is fine as long as you maintain a balance, but that doesn't seem to be happening because that's still not making it possible, you know, for other plants to grow. So this is a way of manipulating the earth, of saying, okay, earth, we don't give a shit who you are, what you are, we're going to grow corn because that's what, you know, that's that's bringing the good price right now. So we're only going to grow corn. So if any wild wheat pops up, we're going to destroy it. So see, this is a, the farmer's way of trying to control the earth. And eventually the earth is going to say, no, I don't think so. Yeah, and then next thing you know, you have this creation of this thing called Tornado Alley going up and down the center of the United States where all this fire burning thing used to happen every 10 years. So now the earth is, you know, since we stopped doing that because of America saying Indians must stay on the reservation, then uh, that's, that now upsets the balance. And so the earth has to restore it somehow. And the only way she can do that is with these tornadoes. These tornadoes, these you know, they create these thunderstorms. So she's calling on the thunder beings to come and help. So they come and they and you know with the with the winds and they whip up these really powerful storms. So that, you know, since we're not putting nitrogen into the ground anymore, now the thunder beings have to. Yeah, so, it, but the, the only way they can do it is through these storms. So now we have these major, major tornadoes happening. And, uh, and now, you know, with global warming happening, this has to happen even more. Yeah, because the droughts are getting more severe then this has to happen even more. So the more the more uh, severe droughts you see in America, the more severe the tornadoes are going to become. Yeah, because they're trying to restore the balance that was upset when we were put on reservations. Now, and and most Indians don't even know this. That's the sad thing, is that most in this what I just told you, most Indians don't even know this. You know, why is that? You know, why is it that most Indians don't know this knowledge? Well, let me explain that to you. Back in the late 1800s, when we were placed on reservations, there were prison camps in the beginning. And uh, this is um, 
a situation where we couldn't leave, we couldn't, uh, we were not allowed to hunt. Our knives and guns were taken from us, and um, we were only allowed to eat whatever the American government gave to us, which was really no good food. The quality of the food was okay when it left places like Chicago and stuff like that, but once it got to, you know some of these train stations uh, between there and the reservation, uh, a lot of these um, uh, handlers would sell it. And then um, they would buy old food and put that in there instead, and these uh, middlemen would make a lot of money. Yeah. So by the, what we got on a reservation was bullshit food. Yeah, it was really no good. And we ended up getting all kinds of diseases like uh, heart diseases, uh, hypertension, diabetes, you know, things like that. And then at the same time, our language and ceremonies were declared illegal by the United States. So we were hit physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Soon after that, our minds became weak. And these, as I said earlier, these are the four parts of the self. So with the four parts of the self being sick, we lost our connection to our sacred center. So we started to focus on communicating away from that. And then the priests came from the various churches, and they learned our ways and said that since our ways conflict with the Bible, that our ways are evil, that they come from Satan. They come from the devil. So in our weakened states, we slowly began to accept that. Now, another thing is that there were some Lakota people that didn't want to accept that. They wanted to hang on to the traditional Lakota star knowledge ways. And if they revolted, they were sent to a mental hospital in Canton, South Dakota, which was set up for all reluctant Indians in America that did not want to become Christianized. They were sent there. And they, uh, the, these church priests also committed the medicine men, medicine women, holy men, holy women, they committed all of them to these mental asylums too. This way, the people would not go to them for help, that they would come to the churches. They wanted the Indian people to only go to the priests and not their uh, traditional healers. So they sent the healers to med. Uh, they sent them. Excuse me. So they sent the healers to this uh, mental asylum to die. And if you are radical, you were sent there to die too. Yeah. So um, while this is happening, the priests are saying to the uh, Indian people, "If you uh, believe our way, we will help your children." And so. You know, it was a very, very dire straits time. And so a lot of Indians became Christians because of that. Like I said, it, 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 we were weak-minded too at that point. And those who stuck it out, there were people who refused to accept Christianity, but they went to church anyway. What they were doing was they were putting up a candy store front. On the outside, they were acting like good little Christian Indians. But on the inside, they weren't. They were star knowledge people. Yeah, They did this because they didn't want to get sent to that mental asylum to die. That's sad, isn't it? But that's part of what happened back then. And it's because of these people who maintain this knowledge in secret thanks to them you know they passed it down you know to certain people like me and we still have this knowledge and I have this show and I'm sharing it with you because this regards the sacred center and we all have that yeah this is not a Lakota thing this is a Ikche Oyate thing Ikche oyate means human being. 
when you live this way, as I said in the beginning, you communicate as a human, not as a Lakota, not as a German, or a Japanese, or an African. You communicate as a human. Yeah? That's really important to, to, to know. So, that's how it was back then. Yeah? Now, remember I said that the, the priest said to the Indians, we will help your children. So, they took the children away from the parents, sent them to boarding school hundreds of miles away, where these children were tortured to speak only English and learn a civilized Christian way. If they spoke about home, they were tortured. These schools didn't do background checks in those days. Yeah, uh, The pay was really low. So they got really no good teachers in these schools. A lot of these teachers were sadistic. They got sexual pleasure from torturing people. And here, this is like summer holiday camp for them. And the same thing for perverts. A lot of perverts now have their pick of the litter. And they could get away with it. That's what happened. A lot of these children were murdered. They were killed. They were raped. They were molested. And there's a lot of unmarked graves near these schools. Not all of these children are accounted for. So, those who made it through, what they learned was whatever they saw. Because a lot of these children never went back home. They were told by the priests that their families had died and that there was nobody there. And that broke their hearts. This is why some of these children, they were so sad, they couldn't eat. And they ended up starving themselves to death. And those who made it through, like I said, they didn't really survive because they were not able to process all these emotional traumas that they experienced. They didn't know how. Because the only adults that were around them were these unhealthy, abusive people, teachers, dorm matrons, cooks, janitors, priests. They were all unhealthy to them. That's all they knew. They learned how to become victims, and they learned how to become abusers to those who they considered weaker than themselves. So they didn't really survive. A lot of these children that made it through these schools, they had a lot of traumas that they didn't know how to deal with because all they saw was abuse. That's what they learned. They had, there was no adult healthy role models to emulate. I remember I said these children were told that their families were all dead, so they didn't go back during summer holiday. They just stayed at these schools and worked. So when they left these schools, they tried to live in mainstream America. Nobody accepted them. They would say, ah, you're a heathen. You're a dirty Indian. So they couldn't even get jobs off the reservation. And when they went back to the reservation, to their people they ran into more problems. Many, many times they were not even accepted by their own people because their own people were saying, oh, you're too white. You act like a white man. So they're caught in between. So a lot of them turned to alcohol to try to hide all of it, to try to forget everything. They turned to alcohol and then later drugs. There were some who tried to make it. They, you know, they married each other because they knew each other went through the same thing. And they didn't want their children to go through what they went through. 
So they didn't teach them the language. They didn't teach them the culture. Those children, the children of these uh, first generation boarding school uh, people, those children are today's elders. When they were born, they didn't learn the language. They didn't learn Lakota Star knowledge. They never got the opportunity to. When you look at an old person on the reservation today, they're not the connection to the ancient past. No, they were born in a Christian background. At a time when the reservations were strongly Christian. So this is what happened. That's a native experience that a lot of people don't realize. And this, is, this is what happened all over America and Canada too. So the next generation, they are sent to boarding school too. No choice. It's a little bit better, but they're still abused. They're still getting treated really no good. And so they grow up, have children, and they don't teach their children anything. What what can they teach them? They don't know anything concerning their own language. This is why today most people cannot speak their own language and what little cultural information they know is Christianized. Meaning, it's dualistic. And it's not the original ancient form. Okay, so the first generation of Indian kids that were sent to boarding school, since all around them were unhealthy adults, who did nothing but abuse them. They didn't receive healthy parenting. They missed things that they should have learned about life. So they're lacking emotional development. So when they grow up, and those who make it through these boarding schools and then they, they have children, those children are also lacking that emotional support, that emotional development. Because the parents don't know how to do it. Yeah, All they knew and all they learned was abuse. All they experienced in these schools was abuse. So they have a hard time trying to be a healthy parent. So they do the best that they can. But the children still are not receiving the proper emotional development, the, the experiences that that healthy children should receive from healthy parents. They're still missing that. And so when that second generation grows up, they know even less concerning healthy parenting. And so, their children receive even less. And every time this happens, the next generation becomes more dualistic than the previous one. So let me try to say that again. The first generation boarding school kids, they didn't receive proper parenting skills. So when they have children... Their children are not receiving healthy training that they should be receiving. They're receiving even less than their parents. Now that second generation, when they grow up, see, they know even less. So when they have children, those children are are receiving even less. And it gets worse with each generation, which also means that the less healthy emotional development they receive, the more dualistic they become. So with each generation is more becoming emotionally underdeveloped, they are also becoming more dualistic. So today, it's a huge mess on the reservation. We're incredibly... As a whole, 
We're incredibly underdeveloped emotionally, and we are incredibly dualistic. We're quick to attack each other. We're quick to pull each other down. We're just like the rest of the civilized, dualistic world. Notice I didn't say white man, because this is all over the world. It's not just among white countries. It's all over the world. Wherever there is a dualistic ideology, where one gender is considered less than and property of the other gender, you're going to have incredibly underdeveloped emotional people, which equals incredibly dualistic people. And that is unhealthy. So that started by the time of the late 1800s on the reservation. And because of that experience, you can see, you know, when uh, like a, a lot of the knowledge that Indians had back then was done away with by the Catholic priests because they said, since it uh, conflicts with the Bible, then that means it comes from the devil. So the according to the Christian priests, the devil told us to burn America. <laughs> I think that sounds funny. <laughs> but no, we didn't get that instruction from the devil. No, we didn't. We got that from the earth. Yeah, by living uh, as a human being, as a grandchild of Grandmother Earth, you are in tune with her because there's a piece of her inside of you. So as long as you live in that healthy way, you will be able to communicate with her. But when you communicate as an Indian, as a Lakota, then you lose that connection to the earth. Not because you're communicating from your, your skin color. You're communicating from your culture. And all that is on the exterior. Yeah? Uh, what the show is about is communicating from the interior, where reality begins, where your sacredness begins, where your role as a blessing begins. So this knowledge also included that we needed to, um, you know, burn the Great Plains area because these beings that will be in the fire are going to do a sacred work, and that's to replenish the earth. That's why these things happen. If we don't do that, then the earth has to find a way to, to uh, accomplish it, and that is going to be in the form of tornadoes, yeah, major hurricanes, and and it's gonna it's gonna veer off all over the place. So, because we haven't been doing that, um, now it's trying to rebalance itself. So more fires are going to happen. That's just the way it is. More fires are going to happen because the Earth is trying to rebalance herself, and she's going to do it. Yes, yeah, she will accomplish it. She doesn't need us, but we need her. We should always respect that yeah, and remember that. So it's nice when we communicate from our sacred centers and live with her yeah, so that we can communicate you know, in a healthy way from our, as humans to, uh, to each other so that we can do her work, yeah, that we, we see each other as brothers and sisters and not races. And this way... Um, we keep our communication to her and, and she tells us what needs to be done, yeah? what what uh, kind of work needs to be done. And we should do that because, man, she gives us everything. Yeah? All these wonderful plants and vegetables and fruits and, and uh, you know, that come from her. And all, not only that, but the animals that eat those things and then we eat some of those animals and they're they're healthy, we're healthy, everything is healthy. We give something back we don't just take, we always give something back. Yeah? And we keep this wonderful relationship like this. And when we don't maintain that, then things are going to go wrong. And that's what's happening. Yeah? That's why the, uh, our selfishness, human selfishness, is, is starting to affect the, the climate and that 
the earth has to adjust accordingly. So the more we abuse the environment, the more the earth is going to do something and in the form of storms, very major storms to reestablish balance. So you can be a part of that process of helping her by just living a healthy life. Yeah, don't put the poisons in your body. Geez, you have a wonderful body. You can do cool things. You can play the violin. You can tap dance. You can do gymnastics. You can, you know, all kinds of things you can do with your body. And the earth wants you to do those things. And so she gives you the food that you need so that you can do those things. And then so that we can help one another and all live together in peace. And when we disagree with each other, it's no big deal. Yeah, we can agree to disagree, and, and so be it. We don't force our ways upon each other, and we're, we don't become dualistic. And we live in harmony with each other like that, even if we disagree. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. Respect the fire and realize what role it plays in life. It is very important, and and. Um, you know, that when you live in a healthy way and you're using fire in a healthy way, believe me, you're communicating to the beings. And that's a healthy communication. And you will be blessed for that. Guaranteed. That's how nature works. Yeah? Think about that. I thank you so kindly for taking time to tune in and listen to this show. In our way, everything is circular. And we will come back around again. Just the fire teaches us that too, you know, that uh, every 10 years we had to do that and things keep coming back. Plants, yeah, animals and such. So even nature shows this to us all the time. So we just have to listen to it yeah, and observe it and follow it and live by it and live with it. And we'll do okay. We'll learn from our difficulties and transform them into blessings and and gain wisdom and knowledge and peace and we can now help others and and this is what we're designed to do. Yeah? So use that fire in a respectful way. What's most important is that it is a sacred thing. Yeah. And uh just to always remember that when you are eating your food and, and um you know, even if you have electric heat, I mean still remember that because it takes heat to heat it up. Yeah? It takes heat to cook it. And that's coming from fire, no matter what. So keep that in mind, yeah? Thank the fire. <laughs> Give thanks to the sun and all that which keeps you warm and well-fed.